Blanchard has an ID of 2. And there are students that have a faculty advisor of 2. Now, just to, just to simplify things, I'm going to delete the relationship between faculty and course section. So I know that the only thing I know that the only thing that's keeping me from delete from deleting uh, a faculty member then is whether or not they have students. I could I could keep that in there. Then I'd have to essentially duplicate the code that I have. One, check to see if they have any students. Two, check to see if um, if they have uh, uh, courses. But I got rid of that relationship just to simplify things. Now I'll, all I need to do is look to see if they have any students. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to write code that after a deletion is going to check to see if they have any students. If they have any students, that's the reason we can't delete them, right? If not, then what is the reason it can't delete them? Who knows? That could be one of those unusual circumstances where the database crashed or whatever, a table's in use or, or any number of reasons. So I can fine tune my error message a little bit here. All right? Now, I'm going to let it try to delete. And if it fails, I'm going to do this. Um, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to do this investigation to find out if I can see why it failed to delete. Where am I going to put the code for this based on what I described when I want to do this function? I want to do it after it has attempted to delete. Where do I want to put in the code behind file? What event? Uh, whatever you're firing, you get that error. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of the question. <laughs> where will I know this? Where will I know whether the delete failed or not? In what function? In what event? Item deleted. Item deleted, right? Remember, there's always item deleting and item deleted. Uh, and um, it, it is an okay approach, it's not anything wrong with it, to try to delete it. And if there's an error, then you, you, you write some code to, to handle that error. So right now we have some code to handle that error, but the code is very minimal. All right. The code looks like this. the item deleted event, if it succeeds, fine, we redirect them back to the faculty maintenance um, page. If it fails, we simply say that there's an error. Now, what we want to do is we want to check to see if there's any students. All right? Now, one of the things that we talked about way back when we did the... Um, when we did the what function was it? What what <coughs> example was it? I think it was a tuition calculation where we made a custom object or a custom class. The one thing that we said was that we don't really want a lot of code in the events. All right. Um, for one thing, that limits the reusability um, aspect of it. All right. Um, so, what we can do is, I'm going to create a function, and I'm going to call that function, and I'm going to put that code there. That way I have the fighting chance of being able to reuse that code. And, later on, again, I could extend this and put this in a, in a custom class or whatever, alright, 
But for now, we'll just break it out and put it in a function. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say I'm going to dim student count as an integer. I'm going to call a function that says student count equals get number of students. And I'm going to pass the faculty ID to that function. Where do I have the faculty ID on this page? Now I realize this might be a while since we looked, last looked at this page, so the answer might not be immediately apparent. But if you think about it, we have the faculty ID in this page, right? Because when we click on someone, we bring up a details view that only contains them. So how does this page know what faculty number? FID. But, okay, but where is FID? Query string. It's on the query string, right. So actually what I can do is I can look to verify this FID. Because again, I change that up from example to example. So let's go in real quick and verify what that's called. In this case, I'm calling it key. All right. So it's on the query string and it's called key. So what I can do is I can pass to my get number of students request, that comes from the client, right? Query string key to my function. Alright? Now I just have to write my function. So I'm going to go and write my function. What I call it. Get number of students. it an integer, right? I'm passing it the ID of the person, and I'm returning an integer. Alright. Then define my variable. I'm going to initialize it to zero. Then at the end I'm going to return it. <coughs> then I'm going to put the code in here to actually do the calculation. Right? Uh, again, remember the notion of a stub function. All right? The notion of a stub function is I could, just to make sure I got the lines of communication right, I could do this. In fact, I will do this. I'll go in and I'll say, let's pretend everyone has one student. All right. I'm then going to go in and say, if student count greater than zero, then Label air dot text equals has
There's an unknown error. See what I'm doing? I'm, I'm faking that function out. All right. I know Blanchard has some students, so I'm just testing to see if this mechanism works. And then I'll go and actually make it really work. I'll, I'll put the actual functionality in. Now I'm just making sure that the, 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 the functions are talking to each other correctly. And that's not a small fee. All right. Um, the one thing that you know, uh, uh, programming, you know, modern programming, is less about writing these giant monolithic programs that do everything, and more about writing components that talk to each other to, to get something done. So getting all those components lined up and talking to each other is a big challenge in, in modern programming. So that's why an approach like this, I think, is good. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to run this, and even though my function isn't complete, I'm going to call it, give it the argument, and get back and see if it does its thing. So I'll go and run this. Pick Blanchard. Click Delete. Am I sure? Yes. And it tells me it has one student. All right. Uh, I could do better than that, right? I'm, I'm going to, you know, because to say it has one student isn't something that you should say at a college, right? So. I'm going to put another if in there that says if it is uh, equal to one, then say has one student. All right. Now, again, I, I haven't coded this, so I, it's too early to get happy now. But I have proved that my function um, are talking to each other. Alright, 
and they come from the web config file. All right. In the entry for the connection string that we created. See, for this connection string, there's a connection string, and there's a provider name. So we're, we need to pluck that out of the web config file. Well, the way that we do that is we use the configuration manager object. The configuration manager object is a way that we communicate with that web config file. So what I can do here is I can say obj ds.provider name equals configuration manager. And all that is, is it's an object that allows us to get into the web config file. What do I want from there? Well, connection string. I want to pull values from the connection strings that I have. What's the name of the connection string? I have to supply that within quotes. Well, the name of my connection string is connection string school. That's the name when I made this up that I called the connection string. Now it might be that you forgot what you called it, right? But you can go into the web config file and find it. All right? You also have seen this every time you've created a SQL data source on the drop down it says the name of the connection string. And if you didn't do anything to change it, hint, your connection string is named connection string. All right. But again, it's better probably to have a little bit of a descriptive name. Now, what do I want to grab from that connection string? I want to grab the provider name. Because that's one of the attributes of a connection string. The other thing that I want to provide is I want to provide uh, pull the actual connection string. It's kind of funny that a connection string has two parts, a connection string and the provider name, but I didn't make this up. Now, if you're watching closely, I can't even blame this on, on my eyes, all right? There's a little squiggly line underneath OBJDS. Why is that little green squiggly line there? I assume there is because my eyes seem to be doing better now. I, I don't think I'm seeing that little squiggly line. It's really there. It's really there, good. Why is that there? Well, let's put our mouse over it and see what it says. It says variable objds is used before it has been assigned a value. A null reference exception could result at runtime. Ah, remember, with an object, you don't just declare it. You also have to instantiate it. So therefore, I should say uh, dim objds as new data source. And that clears up the air. Right? Um, primitives, like integers, which are just basic, you know, simple values, that's not the case with. They're simple. When you dim it, that also creates it. Objects and classes are a different beast. They, they typically involve more resources. Therefore, you want to have tighter control over when you create it. So when you dim it, that's not the same as creating it. You have to dim it and instantiate it. This does that all in one swoop. All right? So we've gone and we've created our connection string, and we um, set the provider. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to create the SQL statement I want to do. And I'm going to say obj ds equals, oh wait a minute, that select command <coughs> equals, well what do I want to do? 
pardon me? I want to count the number of students, right? I could return a list of students, but in this particular case, I'm not interested in, in the names of the students. I'm not saying, no, I could. I could say, this person advises the students. And maybe, depending on time, maybe we'll add that functionality on there, or, you know, or maybe not. I don't know. We'll, we'll see how it goes. You can request that if you're interested. All right. Um, so I want to select the count. So select count star from student where FID equals a parameter. All right. Now, I'm going to go and create that parameter. And I'm going to say objds dot select parameters. I'm adding that parameter to the list. FID. And I'm getting the value from where? from the key on the query string, which I've passed into this function as arg ID. So with the thought that maybe we would want to pull it from somewhere else, I'm going to use the arg ID. statement and this is where things deviate a little bit from the um, from the um, what, what we've done before I have to set a couple of other parameters I have to set a data source mode for this and my choice is a data reader or a data set. A data reader is a simpler, more straightforward. It just allows us to grab some data out of it. And that's really what we want to do. I don't want a full-blown data set. So I'm going to select data reader. I then need to type in a statement that is a little... Add. And this is such a straightforward statement, I don't, I don't think I'm going to bother explaining it in, in any detail. That was a joke. All right. Let me 
explain to you the effect of this statement, though. The effect of this statement is, right, is creating a I data reader object, an object for which we can create or, or we can pull data out of um, the results of the query. And it's calling it my reader. It is populating that from that OBJDS that we just created, which means the select statement with this parameter. And it's formatting it as an iData reader because we specified that the source mode for this data source is a data reader. So effectively what this does is this executes the um, SQL statement, the SQL select statement, with the parameters properly plugged in. And it gives us back a reader object. The reader object you can think of as being like a list of rows from the database. All right. The reader object has in it rows and columns of data. Let's say I returned every faculty member and, and all the. Let, let's say the select statement was select star from faculty. It would return an FID a first name, a last name, all right, then the next faculty member, their first name, their last name, all the way down the list. So each row in there is a record, is one person's information. And that row is cons you know, consists of several columns. With the reader, we can loop through this result set one row at a time, and address the individual columns. Now, my select statement here, <coughs> how many rows is it going to return? As many as are in. I heard all of them, as many as are in are, the yeah, student table. Are in there, yeah. Do we have another answer? Where faculty ID equals something. Oh. That's whatever matches the input parameter. What if I were to tell you that this SQL statement is always going to return exactly one row, no matter how many students this person advises? Would you believe me? Is it? <laughs> that, that's a loaded question. One I guess, yeah. row in a like a comma delimited, no. delimited format? No. no. What's that SQL statement saying to do? Is that SQL statement saying to return every student? No. That SQL statement is saying return the count of the number of students. Therefore, this is simply going to return the number of students for which this WHERE clause is true. So if they have no students, if they advise zero students, all right, they're gonna, that's going to return a zero. It's going to return one row that contains a zero. If they have five students, it's going to return one row that contains a five. If they have one student, one row that contains a one. 